Welcome to the weekly discussions for the Blueprint Bible Study, hosted by the If Then Move team of Rebecca Lehman and Wendy Fitzgerald. Each week, we invite you to join us as we wrestle down and process through the big ideas of the study. Well, hi, everybody. We are glad to be back with you on week two of the Blueprint Bible Study discussion. Today, I am here with Rebecca. Hi, everyone. And we are talking about kingdom and empire, which is one of those topics, as we kind of started talking about last week, that um, sometimes we don't have category for in our mind, but it's something that's a, it's a huge thing within scripture um, to understand the difference between kingdom and empire. So today we just want to jump right in and um, actually kind of start with some definitions there. Um, if you were to look up on Google or if you were to try to kind of find some definitions for kingdom and empire, in a lot of ways we have found that kingdom and empire are similar. Um, kingdoms and empires, a lot of times just the differentiation is between um, an emperor is the one that is in charge of an empire and a king is in charge of a kingdom or the ultimate ruler of the kingdom. And sometimes you see within history um, governments that are called kingdoms that ultimately are more like what we would describe as empire. So Rebecca, you and I have talked a little bit about um, just making sure that we understand as we get into today's discussion, when we say kingdom and when we say empire, what it is ultimately that we're describing. And so, yeah, and I think specifically when we say kingdom, we are referencing the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Like a specific yeah. kingdom, not just any old kingdom. Not any kingdom, correct. So we just want to make sure that that's clear before we jump into this discussion. Um, and for what we're talking about today, some of the best understanding that I have had in understanding the difference between the kingdom of God and empire um, or kingdom and empire would be that empire is often achieved through conquest or force. So a, a government will want to take over another government close to them or another territory close to them. And through war or some kind of overtaking, they acquire that land and that part of, um, I guess, that territory as part of their empire. And so empire starts with force and um, acquires by force. And kingdom is more defined by something that is more birthright oriented. Kingdom is more um, family oriented in how it is. And kingdom is more about taking care of its citizens um, than maybe an empire would be. Empire is more fear-based, where kingdom is more love-based, based on the way that we can see it in scripture. I think one way to describe this that we talked about during this week's study would be to look at it as power, um, and with empire, look at power over other people. Mm -hmm. In empire, you're ruling over people. And in kingdom, um, the power is under someone else and so one takes the the power and it's like a, a lordship over someone else and the kingdom of god or kingdom of heaven would take that power and say we are under the lordship of god and so it's just a, a, a different perspective in how that power is seen and how it is um used within those two different realms. Yeah. And I think a lot of times it depends on your um, perspective of the person in charge. Yes. Um, if the person in charge is qualified to take care of you, then you will naturally submit under that authority. Um, but if that person in charge is taking care of you because they have a forceful way, like you have to, do what they say or something bad will happen to you, then that's the, that's the difference. Yes? Possibly. I think that could just also be part of our American individualism that you're speaking of there. Thinking about children and their parents and wanting to submit versus not wanting to submit. Um, 
And that's a small microcosm compared to what we're talking about with kingdom and empire. But I think that it has to do with um, what you're saying there is more of like controlling a behavior versus transforming someone's behavior or someone's behavior being transformed by being part of the kingdom. I like your, your uh, definition there of family. Like a child is born into a home and in that home they have protection, they have um, provision, they have position, and all of those things are what we would equate with kingdom, which is maybe why so often in scripture we seek kingdom and family as the or family as the definition of kingdom. Or adopted into a home. And I think that's the yes. reference that like Romans 8 would use in scripture about how, you know, we are co-heirs with Christ as children of God. Yes. Yes. And both of us being adoptive moms, we understand that completely. Like our children came into our home, but they have the same pos- position and provision um, of a birthright in that home. Correct. So Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. Well, This week, as we're kind of talking through that, I know that in the study, we've had some pretty good descriptions of that. Yeah, and one of the things that we talked about last week that I want to bring to the forefront of everyone's mind again this week is just the concept of not having a category in your brain for something and therefore not having a file to place things in. And I think this entire concept is one of those that I hadn't really learned about in Bible college. I had learned a little bit about it. And when you read scripture, you know that you read about the kingdom of God is near, the kingdom of God is coming, and you see that in scripture. But to really look at kingdom as a form of almost government compared to empire and what that looks like, I never really taken the time to delve very deeply in that. And I'm not sure that I even had pictures in my mind until I started really looking at, um, honestly, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life and how God's original plan was for us to have our human place overlap with his place. Like it was all one. There weren't two different places. And um, it was all one. And Adam and Eve had oneness with God the Father in a way that I will one day when I am fully known, when I am with him all the time. And after the fall, then that separated and we started to see the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, as it's sometimes called, as and the kingdom of the world or the kingdom of earth. And so Mm -hmm. when you look through scripture, you're not going to see the words heaven and hell, but you're going to see these two kingdoms. And that's really interesting to look at as heaven and earth. Now wait, just one second. Instead of heaven and earth. Pause, pause, pause. Because that's, what what are you saying there? Because when I look at scripture, I see the words heaven and hell. You will um, see the word hell, but not as a place. Well, I don't know. You can probably explain this better than I can. But when you look through scripture, you will see heaven and earth used together. I don't think you will see heaven and hell the way that we use it today used together. That's huge. And that I think is that's absolutely from Tim huge. Mackey, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And I, um, I think you're right. I think that there's a Bible project video called Heaven and Earth that kind of talks a little bit about that. And um, a book that I've read, I think you've read it as well, called The Skeletons in God's Closet, um, that talks a little bit about this idea. Um, And it basically, that concept was huge for me, because I grew up in a church environment where heaven and hell were the opposite of each other. Like the opposite of, yeah, they're used as an antonym typically. Yeah. Yeah. But in scripture, if you try to look them up, They are not used together as opposites ever, not one time in scripture. But if you were to look at what scripture actually calls the antonym of heaven, you would actually see earth is the antonym of heaven. So it's almost this this ripping apart that you talk about a little bit in our study of heaven and earth, which were supposed to be together when Adam and Eve chose to be something different. Right. And then we'll see as time goes on that we are living in a time today 
where Jesus came back and when you start to look at his coming as ushering in the kingdom of God back into the kingdom of this world or the kingdom of earth, then it kind of creates this place where I can have all of these different files that I start storing here, looking at kingdom in a different way than I've ever looked at it before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we've touched on a little bit in the study is how often the kingdom of God is mentioned in um, scripture. And so when you start to look through and you see how often Jesus talked about it and how often the writers of the New Testament talked about this thing called the kingdom of God, it has to have some big importance to us. So mm -hmm. I think you gave us a visual of that um, and in our study with the two circles. And I, I'm so visual, you know that, and I'm so thankful anytime you can give me a visual <laughs> to help me understand that. Um, but I also think that the visual that you gave that actually was the, you have the two circles in the different colors, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so basically the first circle was both circles together overlaying each other. Like the kingdom um, of God and the kingdom of earth were all one and the same. There weren't two separate things. And then those two circles separated out. So now we have the two different color circles. Mm -hmm. One being the kingdom of God or sometimes called the kingdom of heaven. Um, and then the other being the kingdom of this world or the kingdom of earth. Okay. And in our discussion today, we would go ahead and equate the kingdom of God with kingdom. Yes. And what is the kingdom of this world would be equated with empire. Correct. Okay. So just to make sure we're all clear on that, the kingdom of this world is equivalent to empire. The kingdom of God is equivalent to kingdom. If we're talking through things and we aren't clear on that in the future, I just want to make sure that that's what we're, we're connecting. And then you have one more uh, picture in our study this week where it's a circle with little circles inside of that. Yeah, and so that's us like living with Christ in us in the kingdom of this world. And so in a sense, we are set up as ambassadors is one term that I've heard mm -hmm. for the kingdom of God while living in the kingdom of this world or while living within an empire would be another way to say that when we're looking at kingdom and empire. And it's not necessarily just looking at one is good and one is evil. And, um, I think that's how traditionally I had framed things as either good or bad. Mm -hmm. But when I no longer am my own judge of what's good and bad, because I choose to submit myself to God's authority in deciding what's good and bad, mm -hmm. and then I become this representation for God, this living out of God's kingdom of God principles in the kingdom of this world, then I'm bringing little pockets of that kingdom into this one while I'm here mm. on earth. And, um, that's what Jesus did. That's what he mm -hmm. made possible, um, by his death, burial and resurrection and his living inside of us and giving us the Holy spirit that lives inside of us. Yeah. Gives us the same ability to do that. I know one of the things that we're doing at the end of each week is we're kind of talking through this idea of the temple, um, the temple priest and the temple sacrifice. And we're, we're talking about that from a big picture perspective. Um, and last week we talked about how the Garden of Eden was intended to be the temple place. Mm -hmm. And temple would be where God and man coexist together. Um, where God and man are able to meet and be unified. Right. So when the Garden of Eden was separated out, basically kingdom of God versus empire of this world, the ripping apart of heaven and earth that you're just talking about. When those two things separated, then God continued to pursue um, and set up within the nation of Israel, originally the tabernacle and then a physical temple that they built. Correct. And that was the place that God and man would be able to interact um, that man could come close to God and God could be close to man because of that temple space. Um, so God never wanted that to stop and always tried to provide that for us. But then um, when Jesus came, that temple space, what you're saying basically, um, became something that could go back out into the empire, mm -hmm. the kingdom of this world, as pockets of temple 
in us. And like through pockets, us. And through us. Pockets yeah. and places where God and man could coexist and show others who God really was. That's a big concept. It like, still blows big. my mind to this day yeah. a little bit. Like the concept is, of God living inside of me or the Holy Spirit living inside of me. Well, and us being able to take that into the world around us as if we were a place where the Garden of Eden or the Kingdom of God is now existing within the Kingdom of Empire. Right. So pockets of Kingdom and Empire. Yes. That's the succinct way to say everything we've said so far. Yeah, I think so. We are pockets of Kingdom and Empire. All right. So how do we actually do that? Like how, first of all, do we, do we live in an empire world today? <laughs> yes. And how are we pockets of kingdom and empire? <laughs> yes. Period. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that didn't help me very much. <laughs> yeah. I think this is such a um, simple yet difficult conversation to have the one that we're about to enter into here because it forces me to look beyond myself and beyond like where I've grown up and lived my whole life and I think as I've traveled um to different countries in the world and seen kingdom in those countries and empire in those countries as well it's given me more context for understanding kingdom and empire here in this country and how maybe living the American dream um, is more empire than it is kingdom. And mm. that's hard because so much of that is implicit in who I am as an American. And I'm thankful to have been born in the country that I'm in and to have the privileges that I have and to be able to read and to be able to vote and be able to um, do all of the things I do um, as a woman in this society that in some societies I would not be able to do at all or would not have the same opportunities in front of me mm -hmm. that I did here. And with all of that, though, um, there comes a point where my relationship with Christ and my giving of my life to him has to take precedent over who I am completely and be in front of everything else. And I think that's where sometimes this comes into conflict. And I think that even in the New Testament, um, the Pharisees were trying to find a reason to address, to arrest, not address, but they did address him. But they were trying to find a reason to arrest Jesus and they came before him and gave him a situation of, um, I think it was how taxes should be paid in Mark chapter 12. And then I think like in verse 17, if I'm correct, he's saying, you know, give to Caesar what's Caesar's and give to God what's God's. And I think a lot of us have that in the back of our mind, at least that portion of that story in our head. Um... But what happens when what we give to God or what we have already given to God in terms of my whole life and lordship over my life conflicts with giving to Caesar what is Caesar's? And how do we live that out day in and day out um, if there is a conflict there? Does that make sense? It does. And another place that I think we see this in the New Testament is in Romans chapter 13. Because um, Romans 13 is one of those places that a lot of times when somebody is trying to defend um, a political system that they are comfortable with, they will quote the verses from Romans 13. Um, but one of the things that I recently read, and it, it, it just hit me square in the face, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I'll read something and um, all of a sudden it's just like, whoa, why... Why did I not understand that? But now that I do understand it, I can't get away from it. Mm. Um, and the author of, um, it was a book that I was reading. Um, actually, we 
listen to it together. It was called Postcards from Babylon. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was eye-opening to the nth degree. But one of the things that he said in there was before chapters and verses were ever put in scripture, um, a lot of the things that were written in scripture were meant to be contiguous thoughts. And so we look at chapters very often, or even verses, chapters and verses, and we segment them out from the rest of scripture and we forget actually what it was that the author was trying to say, Mm -hmm. because we take just a quote and we make it what we want it to say. And he said um, in this book, often Romans 13, which is given as an example for how to support government or to be a part of government, which is not wrong within the right context, is separated out from Romans 12. And if you take Romans 12 and Romans 13 together and you realize that really what is happening is on an individual basis, we are called to lay down our life, to love our enemies, to bless our enemies, to um, bless them which curse you, bless and curse not, um, and to heap blessings on top of them comes right before this idea of supporting government. And so it goes from this individual, how do I do this, to a corporate, how do we live this out? Um, And when we separate those two, it's easy to actually, um, like you said in the the Mark 12 chapter, um, take them and mess them up Mm -hmm. because they are not to stand on their own. They're actually to be tied to each other in a beautiful tension. I think sometimes, though... um, we do that inadvertently trying to do the right thing. Yeah, I think that a lot of what we see, and I think we've seen pockets of this pop up even recently um, because of COVID, because of the elections, because of differing opinions of what it looks like to be a Christian today. And Mm -hmm. if I am not standing up for something, is that wrong? Am I, these are questions that have been asked of us when we've gone um, to conferences lately too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, what is my place in all of the chaos that I see around me? And it's scary in some regard to see the chaos and the polarization of worldviews. Hang hang on. I, I, did I tell you about the airplane ride that I was on the other day? I got on a plane <laughs> yeah. and oh my word, talking about polarization of views and how weird people are and right now how everybody is just full of tension. I got on this airplane and I'm not kidding you. I felt like I was on the twilight zone. It, before we left the the tarmac, we had to turn back around. People were cussing. Um, there was a man on there that told a woman she wasn't allowed to get up and go to the bathroom. Like it was crazy. And I just sat there thinking, what does our world come to? Like, what is going on that every single person is on edge so much? Yeah. I feel like we're losing the ability to relate to one another in a real way. And I think that, um, isolation because of COVID has played into that for us this year. And I think that social media plays into that in a really huge way. And, um, as you know, we've just recently watched the social dilemma on Netflix, which is a documentary about social media. Um, but it's about, it's, it's so much more than that. And I would encourage you to watch it because it is eye opening in so many Mm -hmm. ways into, what's happening in our society right now Mm -hmm. and how um, we think that we are using something like Facebook or Instagram to be able to send pictures of, you know, my daughter to my family who lives, you know, several states away and as a way to keep in touch with people around us and to show people, you know, what's going on in life and to connect with other people But what we often do not see at all is what's happening behind the scenes and the algorithms that go into the backside of those social media platforms that Mm -hmm. literally look at what I stop on, how many seconds I stop on it, what I click on, and tailor make a feed that 
reinforces what I have told it based on my input. Mm -hmm. And so in Mm -hmm. a sense, I am being used as a product, as an end product in this social media platform. And it's not people who are sitting on the other side of Facebook saying, oh, Rebecca really likes photography or Rebecca talked about um, decorating her living room. And so I'm going to put this ad in her Facebook profile and she's going to click on it. All of that happens through AI, like artificial intelligence and computers are running algorithms that have a profile of who we are that is probably more accurate than any person would have a profile, any person that would have a profile of me on this entire Mm -hmm. planet outside of God. And Mm -hmm. they can change and persuade what people think through these platforms and then they can also reinforce what someone already believes and they can use that and have shown that they have had the ability to persuade and affect um, democracies in other countries Mm. they've had the ability to predict like they can affect real world outcomes with what we think is something that's completely innocent and we use to, you know, figure out how to get um, a great recommendation for someone to fix our roof or how to spread news of our ministry across the United States or Mm -hmm. how to stay connected with friends when we're separated all throughout the country and the world. And, And it is amazing, like in those aspects, those aspects of it I love, But what I don't love is hearing what's happening on the backside and then seeing what I'm seeing in society today and how we are losing the ability to have a conversation with one another because of that polarization and we're not seeing each other the way that God sees us and not seeing the other person the way that God sees them. We're seeing them the way that this platform has portrayed other people to be. And so it's this Mm. concept of, of otherness that we've talked about at different times. Um, that puts my selfish interests above someone else's and that is empire in its most Mm -hmm. basic form. That is empire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's something we do in our, we do naturally, but when it's, underlined and underscored and highlighted unnaturally something that we do naturally that we know we really shouldn't do like it's so easy to find clicks we've talked about clicks forever um numbers of likes and, yeah yes well no i'm just talking about clicks of people oh, like, like c-l-i-q-u-e-s to, okay yes like <laughs> i you know i go to church and there's this click over here or yeah. i'm part of this group or man, those people don't ever look at me. Or in high school, there were the jocks and the, you know, whatever. You have all the different cliques. And we've, we've talked about that forever in society, as this isn't how we should actually segment. And yet it naturally happens. I'm part of this group. You're part of that group. We're not the same. But for the first time ever in history, we are accelerating that as if we've gotten into a rocket ship as far as acceleration mode. And now we have a computer behind the scenes studying what we like and telling us, patting us on the back for what we like, giving us a Facebook feed or a a Google feed or an Instagram feed or a Twitter feed full of all of the people that sound like us. Right. And we cheer them on and they cheer us on. And all of a sudden, our ideals are bigger than ever. And we don't understand why our version of truth that we now believe so desperately. And of course, everybody else believes it because everybody we're seeing believes it. And then we hear somebody different. And instead of having the ability to hear a different opinion, we are so appalled that somebody could have a different opinion that we get angry or frustrated or we try to tell them how wrong they are or we push back against them or and it's because we just want them to be right like us Mm -hmm. and I think this idea of how can I be right has trumped 
how do I love someone else, has trumped how is Jesus righteous. Um, I don't think it's, it's that different than what was happening with the Pharisees in the first century. I think, and it happened even long before that in history, but God's God's desire for us was always relationship. His mm. desire, even for the nation of Israel that you were talking about, his pursuit of the nation of Israel was one of pursuing relationship. But relationship is hard and it gets messy and it takes a lot of effort. And I think sometimes it's easier instead of pursuing relationship to pursue what turned into law that mm-hmm. made me mm-hmm. made a way for me to be okay even outside of that relationship. And I think mm-hmm. that's in some ways where the Pharisees were when you see them um, coming against Jesus and their life was pursuit of this law and Jesus came against that with relationship in a way that was so outside of what they understood that it was difficult for them to understand or comprehend. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's happening today when we pursue rightness. Um, and I don't know that it's out of a bad desire. I think there's a desire in us that wants to do the right thing. We don't want to be wrong. We want to be where we should be with God. We want to be doing what he wants us to do. And so I think the motive is not a bad motive the majority of the time. Yes, there are evil people in the world that will have evil motives. But I think for the church today in this country, from what I hear in the conversations that I've had with people in different parts of the country, the motive is good. It's just trying to figure out what to believe and what that looks like. And um, social media is one platform. Mainstream media is another totally different platform that makes it so difficult to know what is truth and Mm. what is, going back to last week, what we would call the knowledge of good and evil and where Mm -hmm. to be in that. And that's hard. Um, Mm -hmm. And in our not wanting to be wrong, we sometimes even unknowingly buy into the reinforcement that's coming through uh, to us through these feeds that show you're right. You're right, Rebecca, and all of these things that you agree, you're right. Mm-hmm. And so it, it becomes comfortable and it becomes safe because it's a place where I am right. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's huge. Um I think we could say that 10 times over, and I still would need to hear it another 50,000 times. Well, and then to live that out is something, again, totally different. Like, I can sit here and say that to you today, but how I live that out day to day, like, there's a big piece of me that wants to be right all the time. Like, that's partially just who (laughs) I am. I don't like to be wrong. And, Wendy, you can probably... No. You can probably... (laughs) Share that with people more than most people in this world. But anyone who knows me closely would say that that's true of who I am. But there's this difference in the kingdom of God between being right or in a um, in a right place with God. And that would be defined as righteousness. And so sometimes I think even I get this confused being right versus being righteous and what those mean. I think one of the things that you said that is probably bigger than anything else is to be right does not require relationship. To be righteous requires relationship. And Jesus didn't call us to be right. He called us to be righteous. Hmm. And I don't think that you can actually be right for very long without relationship. (laughs) Um, I, I, and I know that that just got really muddy the way I just said that. (laughs) Yeah. I might Um, need you to define that a little bit more because I don't think that you can be in the right position with God without relationship, which is righteous. 
but which is righteous righteous yes yes righteousness so if and i don't think you can be in the right relationship with other people without relationship and i think when an issue and i'm i'm just going to call out the elephant in the room like i think that there are certain issues that we stand on in political parties whether it be pro life um versus choice or whether it be um, immigration or whatever. I, I think that there are places where every single one of us would say, if I know the story of that person, if I understand the story behind that person, then I might have a different opinion. Hmm. But when we do a big brush stroke, it's really easy to stand in one position without relationship involved and be right, but not righteous. And I think that's what Jesus came against the Pharisee hard for. Like that was a heart that Jesus came against and said, hey, you guys are so stuck on the law. You're so intentional about every detail of the law down to all of the details you've added to the law being upheld that you missed the heart of that person. You missed how to love that person. And Jesus came back and he said that if you are not in relationship with other people, with your neighbor, with your enemy, if you if you're not in relationship with them, then you are not in relationship with God. Yeah. And that steps on my toes hard. Because it comes against the place where I want to be right. I want to have a brushstroke opinion. And Jesus says, Wendy Fitzgerald, either bring your toes to me and let me step on them (laughs) or step back and reevaluate. Be careful because the place that you may think you're so right is the exact place where the enemy has tempted you to choose your direction over my direction. And often it takes relationship for... I think that to happen because we grow up learning what we learn in our concrete layers and our abstract layers and we become this human adult person in this society and we are right Mm -hmm. until we meet someone who has a different perspective or thinks different than we do or has a different experience And that begins to shape us. And I think that Mm -hmm. happens with believers who are full out pursuing God, but might have encountered God in a way that I haven't or had to rely on God in a way that I haven't. And I love hearing those stories and Mm -hmm. I love hearing how he moves among his people and Mm -hmm. how... He continues to pursue us to this day the way that he always has. That just gets difficult when we put other things in front of him that yeah. that seem wrong or that mm-hmm. um, seem so contrary or different to who I am. How could you even say that? And I've mm-hmm. had people say that to me in the last several months when I've posted things um, because I've been involved in this in a little different way because of having Livy who was born in Haiti and is becoming a black woman in society of the United States and trying to figure out what that looks like and has asked some really hard questions at 12 as Mm -hmm. she's beginning to explore her own concrete layers of how everyone, you know, her view of the world as her extroverted self is that everybody loves her. And so when she sees things that are contrary to that, it's hard for her to comprehend what that looks like. And then when she sees how black people have had a different experience in this country than what she understands, she's trying to figure out where she fits in that and what that looks like. And my job as her mom is to help her through that process and lead her Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm but still give her the freedom to form her own opinions in that and also keep Christ at the center of that 
as she moves forward in life. Um, and again, that's her choice. Um, it's not my choice of, of where she keeps Christ in that, but that's my example as a mom to her. And so it's been getting involved in things that I don't know that I would have been if I didn't have her. And I don't know that I would have seen the perspective of if I didn't have her. And I'm really thankful for Mm -hmm. all that she's taught me even so far in her 12 years of life. And I know that I have so much more to learn. And it's opened my eyes to how much I have to learn from people who are different than me. Yeah. I love her question to you. Um, at one point she looked at you and she said, mom, would you be doing this if you didn't have me? And I think that needs to be a a litmus test question for us and everything we do. Wendy, would you be doing this if you understood my story? Wendy, would you be doing this? Or Rebe, would you, you know, Rebecca, would you be doing this? Um, if you didn't understand this person's story, would you, or if you did understand their story, would you act differently? Would you portray Jesus to someone differently if you knew that their story required something different than your natural cut and dry? This is right. This is wrong. And I don't think either one of us are saying there isn't absolute truth, right? We're not saying that truth at all is something that is adjustable. But what we are saying is that truth without love is rightness versus righteousness. Yeah. And I think Jesus is asking me that same question. Like, would you see this person differently if you saw what I saw? Mm. And do you trust me enough to know that you don't see the full picture and know that Mm -hmm. I do? And that I have Mm -hmm. asked you to love them Mm -hmm. to the point where I've asked you to love them, even if they're your enemy. Mm. You know, we, we know that that's in scripture. We read it, but we quote it. (laughs) Yeah. We say it, but the people that we are, as a society struggling to love aren't even really our enemies, but they're being made into our enemies because we're Mm -hmm. allowing that to happen. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of one of my favorite movies is, um, (laughs) called the matrix. And, um, it talks about, I was just about to say the same thing. Really? (laughs) Um, so it talks about the society that exists in a world that's been completely, obliterated and so the world that we have today doesn't look like this at all it's basically nothing but humans are um basically only used for their energy but nobody knows that and society looks like it does today and it looks like there's buildings and it looks like there's people but they're all projections from a computer program and so Society, in a sense, is completely blind to being part of this computer program, except for a few people. And I think in some ways we are um, the few people that have the ability to see differently in society today because of our connection with the kingdom of God, Mm -hmm. who are being called to call out um, the masks, um, the unrealness, the unfairness, and some of those things in a way that, um, most people would like to just leave in place because it's just the way that it is. I don't Mm -hmm. know if that makes sense. Yeah. I think I, one of my favorite words of late is comfortable. Um, Are we comfortable? And I think in a lot of times when we're comfortable or when what we're pursuing is comfort, then it's easy to look for what I want versus what someone else needs. Mm -hmm. And that's a good test for me um, of if I'm living from a kingdom perspective or if I'm looking and living from an empire perspective, because empire is going to tell me that it's okay for me to live in this comfort, that God wants me to be comfortable, that God wants me to um, have that. And I think the church in some ways in our society as a whole 
um, not necessarily individual churches, but the church as a whole sometimes perpetuates this idea of um, godly comfort. And I, I think that there's a place where maybe that isn't true, that maybe it's the uncomfortableness that God allows us to understand where the kingdom of heaven comes alive in a place called empire. So um, I think the big question is, so how do we live? Like, how do, how do we live out as ambassadors of the kingdom of God in an empire world? How do we actually do that? And we've talked about like what it's looking like right now and how it's easy to get sucked into this. But for, for us right now, what are the big ways that we can do this? I know you read me um, a couple of quotes that you had seen recently. Um, one of my favorite ones was um, from a political perspective, obviously, because we're just a, a few days away from um, another election here in 2020, which has probably been one of the most volatile um, elections ever. But it said, hey, if you are a believer in Jesus, don't get caught up with the elephants and the donkeys um, or believing that you believe, you know, belong to one of them. But remember, you belong to the lamb. And so I think in kingdom, we get to separate out from everything happening around us and step back from that and say, in this place, am I belonging to the lamb more than an elephant or a donkey <laughs> or the kingdom of God or the tree of life. Yes. Yes. So. Yeah. And I have seen, I've started to see glimpses on Facebook of people who have posted about kingdom. Um, because I don't think it's unrecognized the polarization that we have. I think there's just this awkwardness of, what to do with it in some ways. But I've started to see some people speak up and say that, make posts like the one that you just said, or talk about kingdom, or talk about following Christ, and how that takes precedent over some of the other things that are happening today in the world. And one of my professors from Milligan posted not too long ago um, about how he spent his whole adult life teaching the new testament like that's what he's given his life to and the lordship of his life has been given to christ and so there are times when he can no longer not say anything right now um and basically just said it's never okay for someone who's following christ to put anything in the place of that and that that in fact is idolatry Mm -hmm. When we put anything else in the place of the lordship of Jesus in our lives, then we become, in a sense, an ambassador to that instead of an ambassador to the kingdom of God. And so looking at that as idolatry is an interesting framework within which to see that in my own life and see, is there anything in my life that I am representing more than I'm representing Christ. And what does that look like? And I think that's one way that we can evaluate our lives and live that out. Um, yeah. A couple of years ago, one of my daughters made me um, the sweetest gift. It was just a homemade thing. She took a little um, one by two that we had laying around the house and she stained it. And then she made her own little stencil. Like she cut it out of a poster board and then she stenciled on the top of this little piece of wood um it says embassy of the kingdom of heaven mm -hmm. and um that is what we have over our door when you come into our door now and it was one of the most beautiful gifts that she could have ever given to me because it meant number one that my daughter understood that it's important to realize that we are called to be different in a world that has, that doesn't understand that um, and so every time that we go into our house or we come out of our house, that's the sign that's there is embassy of the kingdom of heaven. That's what our home is. It's a spot that is different. It's a spot where the empire doesn't get to say, this is how you're going to live your life, where culture doesn't get to tell us what we do. But instead we step back and say, Jesus, how do you want me to be different in today's society so that you are seen so that you, um, are, are evidenced. Um, and so that your love comes through me, even to people that maybe think differently. 
um, especially <laughs> to people that maybe wouldn't see you any other way. And so I think as we wrap up today, kingdom and empire, um, knowing that Jesus ushered in this thing called the kingdom of God, that it was his heart, that he said, this is so important to what it means to understand him, that we get to do the same thing today. So I guess our big encouragement for you this week as you walk away is as you go about your day, as you go to work, as you walk into the grocery store, as you encounter someone on the golf course, as you um, are sitting next to someone at a soccer game, even if you're six feet away because of COVID, (laughs) um, (laughs) that you would say, Jesus, am I right now an ambassador of your kingdom or am I choosing to live in my own isolated bubble and is being right more important than being righteous. So go out and be ambassadors for the kingdom of God. Thanks for joining us. We know your time is valuable and pray that you were both encouraged and challenged by this week's discussion. If you're interested in hosting an If Then Move conference, or if you'd like to chat about one of the topics discussed in this session, reach out to us on social media at If Then Move or through our website, ifthenmove.com. We'd love to hear from you.